I make art because I think it's one of the purest expressions that get us closer to understand who we are. I, I think I make art also because I don't know what else I could do. I think I always knew I had to be an artist. I, I don't think I don't think I ever knew exactly why, but but I knew I had to be an artist. Okay, welcome to episode three of Lo-Fi Podcast. I'm still in light in the Netherlands, and tonight I'm sitting down with Santiago Pani. Um, Santiago is one of the, I don't know, how would you put your position here? The Well, one of the hosts. Hosts, there you go, of <laughs> Art House Holland, right? Yeah. And you're working with Dan and Daniel in the Project 1606? Totally. Okay. Yeah. So actually, instead of me saying it, I want to just turn it over to you. Like, what is it that you're doing here? And what's your relationship with uh, the Art House Project 1606 residency in Dan and Daniel? All right, perfect. Well, the residency project, which is Art House Holland, the one that is like running all year, all year long. That one, I, I, dire I direct that project. That's uh, a project I started uh, almost six years ago and uh, we moved it from Madrid to Leiden uh, three years ago and that's a, a project I'm running uh, with Manon right now with my girlfriend uh, on the other hand the 1606 project is with like a special month of the residency where we invited you guys you know like the uh, international artists with uh, uh, a lot of uh, yeah, a little bit more p uh, position in the in the in the market, or uh, uh, yeah, like artists that are already uh, have something to to show, and we have something to learn from them. And uh, so I'm also hosting that together with Dan and Daniel. Uh, and yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's what I'm, I am. What? <laughs> so now I'm thinking of things that I don't already know. How did you meet Dan and Dan? Because I know the two of them met on Instagram, which I think is kind of, it's cool, but also kind of funny. Like they said their story is like, I don't know, it almost sounded like when you have a crush on somebody in a weird way, like <laughs> I'm going to message them. But did, well, I, I think you guys met the same way, didn't you? It was, was it on similar, Instagram? man. Yeah, That's it was so similar. Funny. That's it, cool. It was funny, like, because I, I first saw Daniel's work in, in an exhibition and I really liked the work, but... Uh, the same way that you like uh, works of artists all the time and it, it doesn't mean you're going to end up meeting them. Right. But then I saw his work a year after in another show and I, I liked it a lot and I was like, okay, it's, it's the same guy. I should try to contact him. And then I got in, uh, I, I, I got in contact with him through Instagram as well. But just after I sent him the message, he uh, came to our place like the, de the next day. And we had a bottle of mezcal and we became like super good friends. <laughs> it's always involving booze because that's what Dan told me. They, it was over a beer and he had told Claire like, I'll probably be gone just an hour. And like five hours later and so many beers. It's like, this guy's super cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was that's a little nice. bit like that. I think that's cool. it's funny how it started as uh, from... Uh, uh, like a re uh, out of respect or like admiration from each other's work. Yeah, but that's it great. really got into a nice friendship that yeah we're trying to build up things together now instead of just like admiring each other's work. Yeah, because you, know, so. you guys are really now it, the air that I get and I mean you've been open with this. You guys are also kind of into a sense like now all business partners too. Your artistic friends inspire each other, yeah. but you're working as a business almost. Yeah, like in. In a way, we've realized that, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know, the, the art market is so unstable 
and the economy of an artist can be sometimes very unstable that we have realized that we can try to do new things to uh, fight against that you know like uh, we're trying to help each other uh, to work uh, as a team uh, to be able to approach bigger projects and uh, trying to make this uh, the best the best out of this and, mm -hmm. and get more the most we can like For example, like recently we had a show in Rome and the, the guys were so busy uh, that I ended up going, but it was amazing because I was representing the work of the three of us, not only mine. So then okay. while I was gone, they were being represented. I was still being represented back home because they I know that anytime they have the chance for, they talk about my work with the galleries or with clients or whatever so so it's like realizing that you have support you know, which is the nicest part. yeah yeah you got each other's backs in that yeah. sense and yeah. if one person can't step up to the plate another person can yeah. yeah i think that's a little bit of the the nicest part of it yeah yeah your partner's in the truest sense it seems like yeah totally and like we're trying to do uh, every time more uh, more things together Sometimes, obviously, it's not the easiest because there's uh, our individual projects. Like, for example, Dan, Dan now it's uh, about to have a solo show that he has been working on for a while. Uh -huh. And on the other side, like, I'm thinking about, uh, I don't know, organizing a trip of the three of us to Mexico to do more exploration on the creative aspects and also have some fun and stuff. But obviously, he can't. So at the end, we, we also are uh, meeting in the... In the in the middle and see how far we can bring it as a group and yeah. and in how other things we can't you no know? because obviously we work as individual artists yeah we don't consider ourselves a collective like it's more like a a group you no know? right for now for now <laughs> yes <laughs> and man there's so much to like touch on here like that conversation we're having earlier I'm thinking about that I'm thinking all these other things but I think Real quick, since you brought up Mexico, because that's where you're, you were born? I was born in Mexico. Okay, yeah. yeah, I'd like to start there real quick and just get a little of your background yeah. and your tie to Mexico. So, yeah, just a little bit of that. So, All right. in Mexico, how did you get into what you're doing? So, uh, I was born in Mexico City, and uh, uh, my parents and I, well, my family and I, we moved to Tequisquiapan, to this tiny village, uh -huh. and then... Uh, uh, When I was 18, I said, like, I cannot have more of this. And I went, uh, I went abroad. I went to, on a trip to Europe. Did more of this just mean Mexico? Eh? More than... What, what did you mean? Like, uh, you can't have any more of this? Of thing? Mexico. No, no you were my just, village. Yeah, when you're 18. I, I was done with my village. It was my that village, small. Right? It was it's, that small? It's, it's very small. Like, for wow. Mexican standards, it's quite small. Okay. But, uh, yeah, like, uh, it was like my, my first... Uh, test of what Europe is and what the art, uh, the European art is. And yeah. I really wanted to be part of that. So I decided to, to study art uh, in Paris back in the day. And, oh, nice. uh, uh, but I didn't. Ah, okay. <laughs> I was like, man, I didn't know this. You didn't tell me this yet. Okay, so you no, didn't. Yeah. My, my grandfather was an architect and he studied in the uh, Beaux-Arts. Uh, oh, yeah, Beaux yeah. And I said, like, I can probably do that. But I really missed Mexico again, so I went back. I was, I think, I was not old enough to approach that. That's young, eighteen. Yeah, I, I think I was. So then I just went to back to Mexico and I applied to the art school in Mexico City. I got accepted and I really, really enjoyed it. I was, I think, it's an amazing school. Yeah. Uh, but then I, I still wanted to be part of the European art scene, or, or, or at least see what. It had for me, or what could I uh, give to it? So, mm -hmm. so I, I didn't take that away from me, and I, I just decided to move to Europe, just after I finished. And where did you move to? I moved to Madrid. Oh, okay. I nice. thought it was like the easiest, uh, like a bridge between from Mexico, Mexico and <laughs> yeah, Europe, yeah. and uh, the the yeah. language barriers that you can get in other places, and cultural wise, also we have a lot in common. And I really yeah. loved it. I, I loved Madrid. Madrid's uh, awesome. It's awesome. It's a beautiful place. But also, I, I, I got a bit uh, tired of uh, 
how things were. I think uh, the artists in Madrid are so freaking amazing, but they are a bit stuck in the idea of uh, the uh, recession uh, of mm. like uh, somehow 10 years ago or something. They are angry with the system and they are... Uh, and I don't know, in Mexico, we, we really know how that goes. So we, we are used to it. We make yeah. things happen for ourselves. So having this uh, constant reminder of how things are not working out and realizing that the artists were not really doing much about it, it got me a bit tired. I'm, I'm not saying in, in general, but in some, some cases. Uh -huh. And then the opportunity... Uh, came up for uh, moving the project to Manon's family uh, old cheese farm where we're at now where we're at right now and I was like man this this could be the the best residency I've ever seen it's if we make place. it work yeah it's such a beautiful place like the, the there's a lot of space for for working and there's also like so well connected with with all the other big cities in Holland, but also close to Belgium, you can go easily to Antwerp or to Brussels, or you can go to Paris. Like it's it's well connected and mm -hmm. it's something, but it's still pretty isolated in the nature that you feel like you can have, I don't know, like a creative escape, but without leaving like the possibilities of going to an exhibition, visit right. a museum, like, so I think it's pretty, pretty convenient. Yeah, and you're only, th what, 30 minutes from Amsterdam? Yeah, 30 minutes from Amsterdam, places. 15 minutes from Leiden city center. So yeah, yeah. it's super connected. But, but still, like, I do feel like you're uh, close to nature, which is something I really wanted. Like, as I told you, I grew up in a small village. So for me, this is also important, no? to have the quiet and the... Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. And and yeah, it's nice to to have artists from all over the world come here and and share this place with them, no? Like, yeah. You know, How long have you guys been here doing this? Like this, uh, we got here uh almost well, yeah, 3 years ago, a bit over 3 years ago. Wow, you know, 3 years. Yeah. And, and I think Manon was telling me you, you do it 10 months out of the year. We do 10 months out of the year because, uh, well, one of the the things is that Holland can be really cold in winter. So the studios in the outside are, yeah. are, are not very, very usable anymore. Oh, okay. And I also, I, I, yeah, as I told you, I'm so attached to Mexico still that I use those two months out of the year to go and spend a bit of a longer period in Mexico. Oh, okay. Nice. So you guys both will go from here to Mexico? Usually we do. This year yeah. uh, I'm going by myself, uh, but and we're spending like uh, the holidays here in, in Holland, mm -hmm. well, in Europe. But, uh, but yeah, usually both of us would go and uh, yeah, man, it's, it's super nice. We escape the cold weather <laughs> Perfect. and we, yeah. we have a studio there. Uh, we invested uh, like a year ago on creating art house uh, in Mexico and it's about to be finished so nice. next month that I go there I'm gonna check out all the the final details of the residency mm -hmm. and yeah we're gonna be even more connected to Mexico because we're gonna have to be going and check out how the residency is running yeah so wait, so when you say get finished, you're talking about a different residency. So you're going to be yeah. hosting a residency in Mexico and hosting a residency here. Yeah, like okay. my, uh, uh, well, my, my father is an artist as well. And uh, I convinced them a year ago that it would be amazing to do the, like the second uh, art house mm -hmm. in our hometown. And then uh, they accepted and they allowed me to build it in their own land. So my mom wow. is going to host it. My dad is going to uh, guide and uh, share with the artists as what, like, what is my role here. Yeah. And that, it's going to be amazing. Like, that uh, it, yeah, because yeah, having him there, I mean, he's got decades on anybody of experience. It's crazy. So he's willing yeah. to impart that information and what he knows and yeah every line. all his network all his like know-how and like 
he came last year to the residency here with yeah. us yeah and he realized how amazing it can be to share time with other creatives it's something that okay. it's hard to explain if you don't live it by your own uh, sure that so. totally makes sense yeah so then he he saw it uh we used that uh to convince him like after he came <laughs> exposure <laughs> and, therapy yeah. and then yeah he he liked the idea now, now we're if everything goes well next month uh, we're gonna do the first uh official residency month uh -huh. in Mexico and we want to tr to start with uh, half a year like uh, I don't want to uh, to push it too hard on them if they if they don't enjoy it as much as we do oh, it's, only it's, doing it for six months only doing okay. it for six yeah. months a year at the beginning if uh -huh. they do like it and it's working out and and everything goes smooth then we can uh, yeah do it for the whole year but yeah nice at, at least we the beginning is going to be slower nice yeah and we're going to be able to host at the beginning at least four artists per month uh, and well it's going to be exactly the same uh, cost as it is in 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 here but we're going to be able to offer the artists way more because mm -hmm. well the the prices in mexico are are lower in, in, in general, like uh, from food and services to whatever. So, right. so it's going to be a bit of a more luxurious experience for the artists, like more artists would go to get a bit spoiled. <laughs> that is yeah. something that I mean, I would like to get that, you know, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so then why not offering it to other artists? So that's going to be a bit the, the idea. That is amazing. Um, as you're talking about this, I'm wondering, what's what's the incentive behind doing this? Because it's a lot of work. I've, well, I've seen you yeah. guys, because admit it's the first residency I've done, and I've seen how much you guys put into it and how much it takes away from your own work. Yeah. So what are, why? Why even put all that into it? Yeah, like, and I don't mean that to sound like a defeatist way. <laughs> I'm just wondering, like, really, like, what's the intention? Like? Yeah, no, I totally, I totally feel what you're saying. Like, uh just when i finished the art school i yeah i think that's something i forgot to tell you like i i got invited to an art uh, artist residency in in belgium okay i went there and i thought it was the most amazing thing i've ever seen in my life or how wow. i ever felt in my life to yeah. be sharing 24 7 with other amazing artists learning from each other and stuff mm -hmm. uh, it was really uh, like a breakthrough in my in in my life because i thought this is how I want to live my life, like surrounded with people that I will be constantly learning yeah. and also that I can offer something to them, like I can teach whatever I've learned and learn from teaching because I mm -hmm. think that's one of the best ways to, to learn. Yeah. So I was, uh, I was confronted with that idea and, and I immediately thought, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start my own residency. Mm -hmm. I obviously didn't know how much work it was. Like, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if I would do it's it. It's a lot of work. <laughs> now, now everything is pretty much sorted out. So I think opening a second one is not going to be as hard as to what it was to open. Sure, the first it's like one. anything. Like, yeah, yeah, you do it once, you do it twice. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, was a, it was a whole journey. Like, for example, the, the one in Spain, we really had an amazing place. The conditions of the studios were amazing. But the marketing of the like we we had we knew no one in Europe like so it was hard to to show the people what we had and mm. then by that by those means it didn't work like no, okay. Uh, okay. and then when it started working that we started to know people that helped us with that uh, we were a bit done with the place we said like uh, this is not probably gonna grow till. The place that we wanted to grow so let's just start over uh, use this what we've learned to make this the next one amazing and then mm -hmm. and then what that's what we did like uh, uh, like all I also realized that by sharing time with other artists uh, my production becomes way more interesting like uh, it's not just about mean? like uh, for example I learned uh, so many different things from uh, from artists that I've spent time with in the oh, residency okay, see, yeah. that uh, it keeps me uh, 
excited about creating it keeps me and like entertained and like uh, talking about very random aspects with the artists from their production to their beliefs or to their political ideals or whatever it's just like it's it keeps you like uh, wondering and learning and whatever and it's it's yeah. it's nice sometimes they are very stubborn and it's hard to <laughs> socialize artists are tough people i think to deal with at times they're strong sometimes. personality yeah sometimes <laughs> it's funny that you said the the thing about uh, learning like emphasizing that because i'm as i'm doing this podcast so i started this one a friend of mine in the u.s who has a podcast I think I told you about it. He, we're doing it. We're stitching it together. So he'll send me little bits uh -huh. of him talking, and then I respond. You right? reply when you have time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, yeah. A, it's a really cool experience. But um, he brought up because I used to teach, and then he's really curious about this residency. So I've actually been talking a lot with him about the residency. Uh -huh. And he brought up like asking me like what what I want to teach and why am I doing a residency? And that's exactly what I hit on is. I know as, when you teach, you do learn from students, but not on the same scale yeah. that you do around other artists. And it's exactly the thing I said to him is I prefer to be, I'd rather be a lifelong student. And yeah. constant, and it's really selfish when you think about it, but it it's is, a good position. But, but it is a very good position. Yeah, for and sure. so I can understand from your point of view, because I was telling him here, and, I, and this is going to lead into a question, because... Um, he was asking me like, what is it like around the other artists? How do you learn? And I, so I had to reflect on that. I didn't, I wasn't thinking about it as much. And I realized that for me, my experience has been in the times not making art. I learn more totally. when we have breakfast. I yeah, learn yeah. more at dinner. I learn more when I'm passing somebody on the driveway and we talk for five minutes. Like, those are the things I'm picking yeah. up from people. Like, what is it? What is it for you? Because you got to share your studio with other. Yeah, artists. man. Like, it's I, I I totally understand what you mean. Like, uh, back to the experience I had in the other residency, and like, uh, it was an amazing experience. But one thing I didn't like is that they forced the artists to meet at five p.m. of at every Tuesday to talk about their process and uh, their progress as well, like what oh. have they done and what it's have like they homework. accomplished. And I really disliked it because it was like, uh, I didn't want that day to arrive, you know, like every week I was like, shit, I, I prefer to be working and, and talking to them and learning from each other or whatever, or just doing my own thing. But I don't yeah. want to, be confronted with that at least in this uh, residency so when i decided to open my own i said i'm gonna offer the artist breakfast from monday to friday and that way they're gonna talk about their process yep yeah man. It's, uh, it's totally like uh, it's it's not forced everyone has or wants to have breakfast and they will sit together every morning eventually uh, they will talk you know mm -hmm. like uh, so i think it's way more like a natural way of getting the creatives together because obviously sometimes right now we are all well uh, Walter is a sculpture artist but we are all at the studio like we're all painting and at the studio sometimes we get uh, photographers or that leave the house as soon as they finish breakfast and they never don't and come back till, yeah. yeah so the interaction between the residents would be hard mm -hmm. um, so then with the breakfast or with the going out for a drink or going out for a walk or whatever is where you actually start learning from from the others yeah like for example one of the one of the things i really learned from an, one of the artists i took this guy to uh, to the art supply store and uh, he started like grabbing every single material he could and then at the end of the the shopping like he spent more than what the residency costed like in one day or like he, he spent like so much money in the material and i was like man what the what the hell this is crazy and then he told me like man uh, if you don't have the tools how can you make the work you know like and, and yeah. then it's something that obviously i i don't approach to my materials that way but at least it got me thinking and realizing like man I need to put like pay more attention in what I'm like of the tools I'm using and, and mm -hmm. this kind of thing. So for example, next time I went to the art supply store for my own uh, materials, I realized that I had learned something. 
Very yeah. small, but I learned something. You know? Small, like, but with a big impact. Yeah, yeah, than, than totally big realized. impact. Like now, if you see my studio, it's messy with so much stuff, but <laughs> but it's nice because you I, have a lot of supplies. A lot. Of and you're a tool guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love you're tools. You're the tools guy. <laughs> <I love> supplies. <laughs> yeah, but so like yeah, that's that's like a, a probably like a weird example, but you learn a lot from sharing time with other artists for sure. Yeah. I don't think it's that weird of an example. I mean, maybe some people can't relate to it, but that's exactly how it's been for me. It's not like I learned a new way to mix colors or a new way to... It's yeah. been more things of like mentally, like, or attitude. This is how yeah. I should approach this because so-and-so, like maybe Walter has a better pro professional approach to something that I don't. And yeah. just during breakfast, he said something that clicked with me, you know? Totally. It's yeah. Simple things like that. Yeah, it's uh, I th I think it can also like talking about that. It can be, uh, yeah, like a a knife with two. Uh, <laughs> how you call it? Like oh, uh, we say a double edged sword. Double edged sword. Yeah, yeah. Because if if you are not super sure about your creative process or about your identity as an artist. Uh, and then you go to a place where you're like getting so much information from others and it really changes the way you approach to your own creation. I think that can be dangerous. Like, I don't know. I, That's I, a good point. I try not to, to learn the things that I might not want to learn, but that's mm -hmm. also hard. Like, uh, like for example, right now, uh, Having you there at the entry of the studio, Dan Nopen, uh, Andrew Salgado in the back, uh, Walter coming by, Daniel, like, uh, it's like, oh man, like, how can you not learn from all these people? But also, it's like constantly asking to yourself, how can I also not s steal things or make things uh, that are totally dams into my work? So then it's like putting also an effort to not, I don't know, like, copy stuff or whatever you have to know what to learn like and i mm -hmm. think that's also the the hardest uh, thing because you are at the end sharing a super uh, uh intimate thing like your creative your creative process that you should been doing it for years yeah, yeah it's something you've worked on but i wonder at the same time do you think it's bad that um how do i word this of course you don't want to steal, but let's say like there's always gestation in process. So say yeah. like um, I'm looking at something Dan's doing and then either consciously or unconsciously, I do something Start very similar. Yeah. yeah. And then that first time it's going to look like I'm referencing Dan. Yeah. But if I keep to do it, it could be something that looks different to Dan that I've now incorporated. Yeah. If you, you think know? it like that, when have we not done that no like exactly we, that's, we what, are, that's what i'm getting yeah, is that's yeah, really yeah. what your process is no totally. no one lives on an island mm -hmm. it's like you're stand on the shoulder of giants and... it's totally that but but also i think uh what what i was trying to explain is that it, you have to do it as long as it makes sense to you gotcha okay, because okay. then it's like uh like i have seen it in in other residences like uh, so like in other residents uh, sorry like i have when I started the project, I, I thought to myself that this play has to be open for emerging artists as well for well-established artists. Okay. Because I think the interaction is actually very interesting when a, a guy that has been in the business for, for longer uh, teaches something to the others and, the, and as, as well learn from this new generation. Or yeah. You know? Uh, and I have seen that they uh, take what they've learned very literally, like, uh, and I don't know if that's what they what they want, what they want, or that mm -hmm. they were willing to to get from an experience like this. So yeah, I. It's easier to say what I learn, but I don't know what the people usually take from it. Yeah. Well, it's going to be different for yeah. everybody, right? Yeah. It kind of depends on where you're at in your art and where you're at in your life. Totally. You know? Yeah. Yeah, but I think as soon as it makes sense to you and uh, you can learn so much from every other artist. But right. How do, when you're saying, though, as soon as it makes sense, do you mean like that you're aware of it? Like, how are you meaning that? Probably, yes. Probably that's what I mean. But also probably it's... 
probably doesn't make too much sense. But f for example, I really uh, like I usually spend so much time with Dan and Daniel and, yeah. and both of their processes are so different. No? Like uh, Daniel is uh, way much more about uh, exploring material and like uh, going super crazy with uh, color and concept and plasters and stuff. Dan's work is way more clean, is way more accurate and like totally uh, based on a background of geometry and physics and math and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I admire their work like so much and I I think I, I find myself somewhere in between, no? Like I, I really let, I see that, yeah. let my work go a bit wild in like the, I don't know, like in the, I don't know, having the idea of randomness or of uh, letting the materials work by themselves to tell a story but also with 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 some rules that i i decided to put mm -hmm. you know as i find myself in between i know that i get a lot from them i'm constantly learning and using things if i turn to the left and i see dan using something i might use it on my on my work mm -hmm. but if i feel detached from my work because i think it starts feeling too much like his work I think I would not be comfortable with it myself. Okay, I fully understand. So I think that's uh, that's mainly why I think that it has to make sense. Because if you don't do it for your for your own self, like then why would you even right. do it? Okay. Like, so yeah, uh, so you're yeah. saying like so the opposite of that would be like if you're just blindly doing what somebody else is doing without thought or maybe based on insecurity or you have no other okay. Totally. Yeah, that totally. totally. And I remember saying yeah, I mean you see that in school. With for sure all the time yeah yeah and i reasons. think i think everyone has has probably done that like uh, you you admire sometimes something so much that you want to make it as similar or close to it yeah, yeah, yeah. but then we need to find our own uh, like pictorial language that people can say oh fuck that's a john wentz that's not a something funny that's a john wentz so yeah. then you were like oh okay and if you and you certainly don't uh, want like <laughs> Looks like John Wentz has been hanging out with Santiago Papani <laughs> a little <Yep>. bit. <laughs> totally. That would be a bad thing. You know what's funny is I've never met, and I mean this as the greatest of compliments to both Daniel and Dan, I have never met two artists whose process is so much like their personalities. Totally, man. You know what I mean? I, know, I didn't think about Daniel, that. like, it, it, it hit me on, like, day two. Like, <laughs> Daniel is, he's, he always seems to be juggling, like, 40 things at once. And he's drinking coffee, and then he's smoking, and then he's walking here and there. And then I was looking at his work, and I'm like, that's exactly how he is. Like, he juggles all these materials. Totally. He, and then Dan is, like, quiet, thoughtful, a very sweet human being. And then I watch him paint, and he's so careful, exacting. It, it's yeah. been so fascinating to see this, too. Yeah, man. And unfortunately, I didn't get a lot of time because you were gone. But it is funny because the last two days I was watching your work. And I think you're right. You're, you're one, quite literally in the middle of their working spaces. <laughs> literally. Well, Andrew's yeah. there now. But yeah, you, you look, you seem like the, um, the fulcrum in the middle of the scales, just kind of balancing <laughs> yeah. both. It's really cool. And I mean and, that as like and a I think great compliment. It's totally, it totally makes sense. Yeah. It also, for some reason, in our like group, I became that part like I, I like for example whenever there's a a decision that has to be made and they both have very very opposite points of view I have yeah. to be the one that makes them like fall into you're, the, you're like the, the center and balance things out and, and that's I, cool that's why you guys all worked good together then yeah sometimes uh, Sometimes I'm like, man, why? I'm the I'm the youngest man. Like, come on. <laughs> why me? <laughs> why me? <laughs> Should be my responsibility. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. But with that, like, um, I do want to talk about your work too because I love your work. <laughs> Thanks, and um, yeah, I mean, it, it's been killer to see it in in person. And also, it's it's interesting too. I it only hit me the other day of like how fortunate it is to see people's work like this in different contexts. Meaning, like not just in the gallery. Like if I had heard of you and went to a show, it's different than now we're sitting here doing a podcast and your work is in the corner and mm -hmm. I can see it in a different context. Yeah, 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 you know? totally. And 
simply in a concept a context that it's more uh, familiar for what I actually made it for. It's yeah, it's yeah. where you made it. It's what inspired you, but it's also more comfortable. Like galleries to me, it tends to be. I always feel like not always, but I I often feel like like before here I was in Dusseldorf, and I remember one day I went to the K twenty one. And it hit me at how much architecture will affect my experience. And maybe that's very uh, more obvious to some people. Yeah. But the, the architecture of that building is way different than a lot of museums I went to. Mm -hmm. And I found myself questioning like um, my opinions on things because yeah. of it. Like I was looking at a piece of artwork and my, react, my initial reaction was like, I think this kind of is not good mm -hmm. but because of this environment and the architecture it like, it, uh, yeah it gives yeah. it this air of authority where I'm like I just don't know enough you know? <laughs> so it's nice like it's a really weird experience to be here where I'm, you're comfortable yeah. on all levels like we're having a beer we're around people I enjoy and then there's artwork here and I feel like I can see it without bias experience it without bias you know yeah I think that's some like as we were talking uh, before like uh, galleries sometimes don't don't get the work that we are more passionate about but they get the work that they they know they can sell mm -hmm. and that sometimes it's uh, sometimes you you will meet artists that you'll find out they have work that you've never seen before because a lot of, i'm so surprised how much i come across that now yeah and that and that's amazing like that's why visiting someone's studio or or getting to know an artist or something is so interesting because you actually yeah. get to see a part that you will never see any other any other way. Yeah, and here you get that a lot. Like, uh, yeah, like at the end we're just artists hanging out together. Like you can call it a project, you can call it this and that, but at the end that's what we are, and that's I think it's the nicest of it because. Once you, you come and realize that as another artist, then you're like, man, I, I also become part of it. It's right, not right. like it's me, Dan, and, uh, and Daniel against the others or whatever. It's not like, no, let's make it bigger. Like we are all now part of this. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something you were, we were talking about earlier. Maybe we can kind of hit on that. Is you were talking about Mexico and the community and alternatives to galleries. Like what... Is that something that started there for you? Like, what planted that seed thinking like yeah, that? Yeah, like, I think, uh, as I told you before, like in Mexico, we are a bit used to do things by, by our own, like, uh, hands or by our own means. Like, we are not waiting for the institution to support our project or to finance it or whatever. Right. Because we know it's not going to happen. So then we, we have realized, like me, together with some other amazing artists, that the way to to grow is by creating community, you no, know? like uh, helping each other out. And well, with these guys at uh, in Mexico, uh, they run this project, uh, No es una galería, which means like this is not a gallery, which was like a counter offer or like antithesis of what a gallery is. Mm -hmm. It's like giving back... And that's, that's, sorry, that's Ricardo, right? That's Ricardo. Yeah, okay. Ricardo Santos Ricardo and Pierre Fudarili. Uh -huh. Like, they both started this. And I, it's like one of those projects that I'm always so happy to talk about because it's, it's about giving the power back to the artist. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, this power that has been taken out by galleries, curators, art dealers, like all the market, all the art sphere, which is like we always say the same like we don't we don't deny them we know they we know they are important and we we need them but we want to show that it's not the only way mm -hmm. like artists if we get together we can create amazing stuff and we can generate so much more than what a gallery can even give mm -hmm. and with this idea in mind like we have been doing shows we've we have organized uh, art fairs shows uh and gatherings with artists and and people see that it's like such a uh yeah like a legit and honest project that they just join like it's not like we're even trying to like to to drag a lot of attention yeah. or whatever like you're we're not just recruiting trying to, and yeah no it's just like yeah. people see artists see that it's like super nice and then they join and the community grows bigger and the community at the same 
at the same uh, way that you were asking me like what what do i get from the residency or what do i get for working to create a community with other artists at the end you get so much man like you get mm -hmm. like uh, you get network you get you get clients at the end you get like uh, your sales improve, your name grows bigger, your reputation, uh, it's also nicer because you're not only an artist looking for yourself. Yeah. You look for others and then that's what needs to happen. No? Right, yeah. And I liked what you were saying earlier too about, because um, I think it was specifically with regard to clients, how you all are sharing each other's clients. And what, didn't you say like some, if somebody has a show, then the other artist will alert their clients that, hey, there's, this artist is having a show? Is yeah, that what saying? That's, what, that's what we do. Like, uh, for example, they, uh, they started this uh, uh, WhatsApp group about, uh, for example, helping each other. And that's, that's probably super common. It happens everywhere. Mm -hmm. But we use it a lot for in inviting each other to expos and blah, blah, blah. But also we say like, okay, this gallery is being an asshole. He hasn't paid me. Like you should not work. Oh, uh, nice. Okay. And then the community is starting to grow so much that we are starting to have a big impact in what the market is. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that when we organize shows, everyone b brings their clients. So let's That's say amazing. we do a create a collective exhibition with 35 artists or 40 artists. Then each one brings, let's say, 20 people or, or 10 potential collectors. Then sales happen, no? And then right. the amazing part is like they only take like 10% off. So then it's like all the money is for the artists and yeah. Just but, like, but you also are keeping that client base, um, how do I word it, open to each other. Right? Like whereas, for example, I, I'd say like, you see, there's a trend that we've seen in the last like five years plus of galleries um, doing that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's say we're going to have a 50 artist exhibition, but then they're like, okay, now everybody send out your email blast, make sure to post on your social media. And what happens ultimately is that gallery now gains but all that collector base and now they yeah, own it. That, yeah, they've yeah. expanded their end, but you haven't expanded your own. Man, it's crazy because I, I, like, I have been in exhibitions with galleries like that. And when a gallery is telling me like, okay, man, then you invite your clients. They're like, then why do I need you? Exactly. You know? Like yeah, yeah. Uh, in this scenario, it's, it's not like that. Like it's, it, we're, well, I'm saying we are, but it's mainly they are. Uh, we're, I'm part of the community and I, I'm so happy to be part of it. But the, they're so open and so like uh, clear, uh, like transparent with the information that every artist can access to all the data. That's so like, uh, Yeah, because try and imagine like doing that type of show at the gallery and then be like, okay, now that the show's done, can I have everybody's <laughs> collection, all those emails from the other 49 artists? It's like, no. 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 <laughs> and it's crazy because like uh, to the shows that we've organized, uh, there's galleries coming and art, like people in the art scene are coming and they're checking it out because they say like, okay, this is happening. And then... Uh, this a little bit started as a, a counter offer to uh, to galleries and to one specific gallery and these galleries are actually coming to the shows and they're saying wow. like fuck this is uh, this is what we could have done but we didn't do it right and it's amazing because as it's run by artists and it's for artists the the artists are not like uh, determined or uh, blocked to show one or other thing they can just choose what to show mm -hmm. so then you see actually the interesting or like part of the creative side of the the artists right because they are not like limited by the gallery saying okay i only need you to show this because this is what sells yeah they yeah, can yeah. do whatever they want so yeah so you see like some very sometimes very dark uh, funky shows but i love them man because it's like yeah this is also part of it like it's not only pretty decorative uh, pieces like yeah they're... yeah I, I can see where that kind of because admittedly i think we've all seen where people's careers or shows from a gallery that fine line between art and product starts to slip over to product yeah you know that production line thing and something like that you you're more willing to take a risk to be more expressive or yeah for sure you know but also, so I, I think you're maybe also one of the most humble people I've ever 
humble person, <laughs> the most humble person I've ever met. Because we're still not talking about your work, which is what I want to talk about. <laughs> right. We just went on another thing. Um, we touched, we started to. Um, I'm curious. So I've seen the stuff you're doing right now in the studio, but the, my introduction is like the stuff we're looking at now, which people can't see, which is based off of this one figurehead. Yeah. What's the genesis of it? Because I love it so much. And I love the way it, you've adapted it into these different mediums. Like we're looking at a piece right now that's a painting with neon on top. You've done this in metal sculpture. Yeah. What's, what's the, how did this come about? Like, uh, I was so into portraits since I was very, very young. And um, I, uh, it was a little bit of the idea uh, back in art school that the art theory teachers asked us to come out uh, yeah, to come up with a statement of that uh, would guide our uh, art pra artistic practice. Mm -hmm. In that time, I, I didn't really understand it. I was like, well, I'm an artist because I, w I want to be an artist. Like, what do you mean? And uh, the artists that I know, that, like my, my father's uh, friends and stuff, like they come from the like abstract expressionist and it's more about like the art for the art. And it's like, I don't know, like yeah, there's yeah. not much to conceptualize about what what it actually is so for me it was a bit hard but then i i realized that uh, these faces were constantly coming into my interest that there there had to be something behind it mm -hmm. uh, then i read this uh, theory about uh, there, there's like this uh, psychological theory that says that every person we see through our lives uh, apparently it gets stored somewhere in our subconscious like okay. the image of their faces yeah and when we're dreaming about uh, people that we don't we don't really know who they are like you you can sometimes dream and say like i know i i've seen this person before but i have no idea what's their name or where they come uh, from right, or right, whatever okay. this theory believes that uh, you connect with your subconscious in that moment and okay. like these these people from probably this person that you probably saw like 20 years ago, it comes to that dream and you have no idea why, but it's like a way of your brain and conscious side connecting with the conscious side. And then you dream about this. Okay. And like I, I was amazed with this like uh, idea. And then I, I tried to, to approach to this, these characters or these portraits uh, like from like a very, very visceral way, like mm -hmm. uh, without thinking too much about someone in particular and it was like an exercise trying to connect with the subconscious no then uh, well these uh, characters started appearing and for me these characters are like really really important because they are not necessarily one person in particular but they represent someone that uh, okay. have gotten that my life get to a certain point that we are now sitting here right now having this conversation uh, doing this uh, podcast so yeah it, like the, it's it, i don't know like i would say like an odd uh, all that i don't know how you call it like a like a monument for humanity or something like that i don't know the exact <laughs> word but i said i understand what you're saying yeah it's yeah. uh or it's almost like an like an archetype in a sense yeah maybe, it's, it's totally it. like okay. but for example like uh let's say that uh, 10 years ago you crossed someone in the street that made you stop before a red light and then that's why the car didn't run over you no mm -hmm. that, that definitely de determined it's etched the, in your, your brain. destiny yeah, yeah, yeah. and it determined well like what happened to you and why we are we are sitting here right now because that car right. didn't run over you, you right, know? right so it's like this guy this person you probably don't even know who it is but it made you change your life and uh, so like that's like the power i decide to give to these faces you know? like, oh, okay uh, so it's like uh i don't know it's uh they they always have this same like uh, sort of structure because uh, it, it helps me to to start it over is like the excuse to create this vertical and transversal line and then like the eyes like this very uh, it has become something so natural to me but then they are all pretty much similar but each one of them has its own identity 
Jordan. Right. No, that makes sense. It, it, it did strike me as very like archetypal, and also it kind of reminds me a lot of like primitive masks, which I which I think have that same quality, that, and that's really was kind of their intention is to hit uh, upon an archetype because. You're, it seems, and maybe I'm wrong, but in reading them, you, you're more. In, it looks more interested in gesture than form. Totally. Um, fl, you know, the flatness and, t- and texture seems to be really important too. That and one of the things I love, it, there'll be these really intense impasto brush strokes, but you use spray paint underneath. Yeah. What got you into them? Because am I wrong that your your background is in printmaking? Yeah, totally. It is. Printmaking, oh, okay, and cool. I was uh, pretty, like, uh, addicted to monoprint and to see, like, nice. the textures that come out from when you lift the paper and you realize what the hell happened. Yeah. <laughs> in the so time you're very texture-based. Yeah, 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 totally. Okay. Nice. So, uh, it's, yeah, like, the texture is, is so important to me. I, I, I like to think that uh, any of these portraits could work even if you just take a little part away from it like uh, like this mic- microcosmos that starts happening in, in one painting mm-hmm. uh, we were talking I, I think when you gave your workshop about how uh, you get like these big uh, attraction points that makes you like go into a painting but then you have the mm. details that uh, uh, the impact and payoff thing the yeah, impact yeah, yeah, and yeah, the yeah, payoff yeah. Yeah. I I really uh, like that the payoff it's uh, very interesting and you can really mm-hmm. like dig into it and start creating like a relationship with the painting because at the end it's meant to be that it's mm-hmm. it, it, it's a it's a, a portrait that talks about human relations about uh, yeah it, as you say it obviously has to do with with a mask because well a mask you use it to hide or to empower something or to right. be, yeah, become yeah. something you're not and yeah. even our faces are like this mask that we show people what we want them to see like it's a it has so many like uh, influences and, and concepts that got me to to keep doing them uh, which I didn't even know before like I was like uh, how can I find out a statement that then will guide my artwork I think it has to be like I found my interest and then i will create this statement i don't know if it's the 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 way you should do it but that's how i right approached it (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah, i don't think there's a right or wrong to it um what in some i don't know why one of the things i found more interesting is you using spray paint yeah how did that come up yeah i mean i don't know because here in europe maybe because it, it the emphasis on street art is so intense in europe so I just assume now everybody when I hear a can like they have some you know background in graffiti or yeah. something. Did you? Or? I didn't. Man. No, like, okay. not at all. So it's just a medium for you. Like for me, it's cool. just a medium. Like I, I was, man. I always dreamed of going out and do some tags and like be, but be, 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 be become a rebel. But I, I was never a rebel, so it would have been like super like <laughs> lying to my own reality. Yeah, yeah. But I, I love spray paint, man. Like it's uh, mainly like as you were saying, like the the uh, com- um, contrast between like texture and like forms and shapes and colors. Like I think spray paint gives you so much uh, like I can have a super watery flat background and then give like a super thick spray uh, on top and then you create like a contrast automatically yeah, and, yeah like all the drippings and and then I I sometimes try to do like spray paint on top of like a humid paint and then it cracks and it creates all these like universes in, in itself that I could never be even able to do by by if I wanted to, no, like yeah, uh, just, yeah, I know, mm-hmm. and that, I it, that gets me too because that's one of those things. Like um, when you're schooled in art, you're you're one of the first things you learn is like don't use your oil mediums over your your <laughs> water mediums. Yeah, but you're kind of missing out on some really interesting textural effects for the sake of, and that's a discussion we've had a lot here um, about archivalness. Yeah. You know, because you want your work to last a hundred years or two hundred years, yeah, which is a bit it's kind like, of audacious, right? This is gonna be like this is gonna be my legacy. <laughs> I think every artist has that a bit. Like I think 
I think we all are, we are all super egocentric, and I think we should not deny it. Like by by the time you realize that you want to create stuff that everyone should see, and you think it's like yeah yeah yeah, it, right. that in and of itself already. is an ego. It, act. It's yeah, already yeah, yeah. it's yeah. already it. Look at me, look at and, me. <laughs> and right. I think the idea of transcending, yeah, for sure. But but I think if if, if you have that always in your mind and that's the only means uh, like of why you're doing what you're doing you for sure will uh, lose so much like mm -hmm. I, i sometimes mix like yeah i put my oil paint on top like my acrylics on top of my oil paint sometimes yeah kill me i don't know right. <laughs> probably in 20 30 years it will fall off but man Yeah, I don't know. But it's I like a that. part of it, you know. Yeah, it is. I like that <laughs> ephemeral quality. It's like I remember seeing one time at um, it was in the MoMA, I think, in San Francisco, and they had um, I can't remember which the title of it. They had a large, well, all Jenny Savile's work is large, but one of her paintings where on the figure, she had painted the entire side of the figure white, okay. and it was all cracking. To my totally. and my assumption was she probably used like a flake white or something. Because it was it had a different consistency, and obviously it dried faster than the underneath. Yeah. And my my first reaction was like, oh my gosh, she didn't even think about that, which was the schooling in my head. Yeah, yeah, totally. But then after that passed, and I was listening to myself, I'm like, man, that looks really interesting because you don't see skin crack unless it's a very old person exposed to the sun. It's yeah. like not what I would imagine with flesh. And as now I was like, wow, that's really amazing. Yeah. It's not going to last very long. Yeah, but but also flesh doesn't, you know. Like exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it, it was quite literally mimicking flesh in that sense. Yeah, that's 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 crazy, man. Like I think we are we are so schooled on like art has to be immortal and like the ephemer the ephemeris of life should like don't apply to the arts right. that we sometimes just stop trying new things. Like I know that if I put like. Uh, my acrylics on top of my oil they're gonna end up falling off or cracking i know but probably that's what i want you know like right, uh, right. why why can't it be a possibility yeah yeah uh, like i don't know for example we are always burning stuff to create like nice effects and like uh, yeah i know that's not the yeah i've seen problem. a lot of burning happening here. <laughs> <laughs> but it's yeah it's cool <laughs> yeah yeah and how did so how did you move into like with the neon and then um man the uh you were showing me earlier the the steel sculptures the right. steel sculptures of the head like how did those things come about yeah like i've been like constantly uh interested in trying new uh branches of the arts like mm -hmm. not necessarily uh i don't necessarily know uh why before i do it but then i do it and then i'm like okay that that's why <laughs> that's why i did mm -hmm. it Like for example, I have I have translated my portraits into sculptures, into like these new like paintings with neon light, even into jewelry and T-shirts and stuff like that. So it, it's like for me, it's uh, a little bit more uh, touching some aspects that are not necessarily creative, but it's about branding and marketing ourselves as artists. I think it's necessary to try new new. Uh, new places where we don't feel too comfortable you no know? like Wait, uh, as a part of branding as an artist as to brand yourself like uh, for example like branding branding yourself like in the sense like i'm i'm doing the portraits and i'm only doing the portraits and this kind of thing yeah. that's probably one but also like to market yourself to for example if i if i only paint people in the art scene are going to see my work but if i put it on a shirt or put it on a jewelry or I don't know. Then uh, I'm gonna reach to an, a whole new market that probably oh, would see, not know me in in another way. But do you think that only works, or or works better when you have an image like you have a very iconic image? So it seems to me that kind of lends itself to that, as opposed to like, let's say you did the these portraits as paintings, but then um, as sculpture pieces you did ducks. That doesn't really work. <laughs> I don't you know think what it works that much. Right, so you're saying like that works when you have a very iconic thing. So now I you're taking that and branching it out. I think since okay. I was, since I was very like young and seeing how uh, choosing the art, uh, the arts as a life, 
as a career or whatever can can actually be very hard because mm -hmm. I, I grew up with like watching how hard it can be but also how amazing it can be mm -hmm. uh, I, I thought to myself like okay I can I'm gonna uh, try to make it also like not only about the arts I'm gonna try new things I'm gonna make it work mm -hmm. and then uh, I realized that one of those ways was to uh, I don't know if you have so many different things in your creative aspects as an artist uh, you become like a branding nightmare for your customers right if you think about the marketing side only right you no know, like uh, let's say if I do a portrait but then my sculptures are docs Mm -hmm. you as my client are going to be a bit confused you're going to mm -hmm. be like okay is that the same guy or is this like another artist that is making docs and this mm -hmm. other is making portraits uh, like having that in mind I decided to stick to the portraits not only because they were the most uh, the thing I really liked the most but also because I thought I'm going to work in to get people to understand my personal language and my pictorial language and recognize it as my mine like mm -hmm. you, and then when I when I got to that point I said I'm gonna explode this uh, image that I have created and that now I really feel that it's mine mm -hmm. and I'm gonna show it to the world no mm -hmm. like uh, how can I how am I gonna do that not only with paintings or with sculptures or not I'm gonna try to reach other markets and then I did like jewelry and then the, and then it's like you start creating connections with other creatives that you thought you would never do, like with jewelries or with fashion designers and stuff. And before you know it, your own creative uh, background or, or, or life it starts also growing and improving. Mm -hmm. and now you start seeing things in a different perspective. Like I had zero idea about, for example, the, the fashion world. And now I, I admire it so much after I've seen how freaking hard it is <laughs> yeah yeah it's, yeah it's crazy hard um yeah so it's uh, just a matter i think of wanting to try new things i yeah. think that's what got me to to this so point. maybe first it was a set of satisfying artistic urge and yeah and you found this way of how it fits into the commerce so yeah like at yeah. the end we we all need to to eat from what we're doing so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. do you think because you i feel like you're in a bit of a unique position because your father was a professional artist made his living that way do you think that's is that shaped how you view it because there's a lot of you know that you always you've encountered like there's this you're going to have that um group of artists who are no commerce makes it ugly then you have artists certain artists that are just like all they think about is money they think about yeah. it as a product did that help shape your understanding early on i think totally it did like uh like for example when i decided to be an artist my my dad was the first one that told me not to be an artist <laughs> like i've heard know. that story <laughs> so many times from people that yeah he was like don't do it yeah all my friends in the art school they were like man it it, it must have been so easy for you because your dad was an artist right. and nope like no man it was the opposite nope. like he he really didn't want to and it doesn't mean that he doesn't uh, support my my uh, career or that he yeah. doesn't believe that I can that I could do it or not but he he knew how hard it was yeah but what he didn't know is that I also knew I, I saw it I saw it right. while didn't growing up he take that up. into account yeah. Yeah. you lived it just as much as he did yeah totally and then he uh, like for example I had uh, on one side my father which is an amazing artist and he uh, but he's also such an artist that he's terrible at administration and he's like all about like enjoying life and when you have money you should spend it and like yeah, all this. Yeah. Then on the other side I have my, my mom which is like such a beautiful amazing woman that she made his production actually matter. Like uh, he, he managed to to get with the economy of an artist to make a family to actually uh, exist yeah, yeah so then i i learned from both I, I i learned so you're a synthesis of the two i think i am like yeah. uh for example I, I i sometimes get into arguments with my dad because his uh, uh structure uh outside of the art scene is is not that uh, concrete i think when when it comes to uh administration let's say 
And, but I know that I got that from my mom 100%. So mm -hmm. I, I know how to, to save my money and I know how to invest my money. And that's nice. something that, that I think really helped me a lot. And not only because my father was an artist, but because my family was about the arts. Like uh, my mom is not an artist, but, mm -hmm. but she managed to, to make the administration work for an artist. That's amazing. That's yeah. such a difficult thing. Yeah, yeah, it is. I think, I think it is. But, but at the end, it was like, for example, I, I learned so much from my dad, but uh, I also learned a lot of uh, what not to do. Uh, through a lot of things that he 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 managed to teach me, I learned a lot of things like how how exactly we need to do them. Mm -hmm. uh, I I also learned like for example that that galleries can be assholes and they can like I I I, I saw all these while growing up, so I learned it from like firsthand. So when I got to the art school, I knew I had a bit of an um, yeah like a leverage above the the other kids because I knew how it worked right it didn't mean that I was better or worse as an artist but but I I also knew that it's not only about how good you are right and that's the most important thing and that right? I think that's it's nobody a, realizes that in school you don't realize that no. and and then I I sort of knew it and I obviously learned so much about like the creative aspects I, I would be I think only like five years old and I was already painting his backgrounds as a like playful way and he yeah. would put me in the studio to mix colors and shit like that yeah. so obviously you you learn things no mm -hmm. uh, so yeah i i think it uh it totally uh, molded of like who i am to have grown with an artist uh, dad mm -hmm. uh yeah man. and i i really appreciate it like totally yeah Yeah, that side of, of commerce, I think, is probably the most important. I think I remember my one director from my school, he had told us, I think it was like the last day of school. And I think he took some pleasure in saying it, but he was telling us how that we're going to see in the next year, if we keep in touch with people, you'll see this funnel effect of people like you'll have a certain percentage that stop painting within that year. Okay. And then in that next remaining year, you'll see them fall off till eventually... If you last 10 years down the line, you're, you're just going to be one, one or two of you oh, from the class, right? And this is on the last <laughs> day. But he was saying, and that's one of the reasons why, is because nobody is prepared. And, and in a way, you can't really teach that either, the business side of it. But it's so shocking to people coming out of school where all of a sudden you're like, it's totally shocking. either I don't believe that we should be making money on this and art is art, or like you just don't know how to navigate that landscape of commerce. It's crazy. And, and it, there's almost, it's yeah. not to say it's impossible, but it, don't you feel like, because I often feel like the, like the art world is this weird, like lawlessness. It feels like the Wild West and that there's not, not a lot of rules to it. Like there's how really crazy not... is it that you can just choose the price of your work? Yeah, it's crazy. But well, if the market doesn't pay it, then you, it doesn't Right. Really I mean, work. the market will help whittle you down, but there's no like, you know, that's a big question for people coming out. It's like, what do I ask for my work? Yeah, totally. Like, I think, for example, that's one of the, the hardest questions. Like, I, I sometimes get that a lot from colleague artists that are starting and they say like, man, how come, how, how much does my work worth? And I'm like, man, how, how, how the hell do I know? Right. Like, uh, but then I obviously give them like some tips on how to try to do it. And it's, But it, it never, it, it, it's not like just one rule. It's like, as you say, it's like a wild, wild west where there's not many rules. Right. Uh, at the end, it sort of summarizes that if you, you can say that your work is 20,000 euros, but if no one pays it, then it's actually not. It's not 20,000 <laughs> no, no. Right, right. Yeah. So, but yeah, obviously, like if you're starting, also these kind of things don't make too much sense. It's like, uh, okay, I see this guy selling for... Uh, 25,000 euros and I'm his same age probably mm -hmm. it should work my my work is worth that it's like yeah no it doesn't work like that right right you know, like right. it's I, and I think if it was if it was so easy to explain it it would also be way more boring <laughs> so, yeah that's a good yeah, no. optimistic way of looking at it I always try to be optimistic you are you're the most optimistic person <laughs> I've ever met I, think. I like that I tend not to be
Yeah, man. Yeah. Like I, yeah, I don't know. Like obviously, I I have some some questions myself and struggles and stuff, and I it's sometimes hard to be optimistic. But at the end, as when you decide to become an artist, like you're, it, yeah, it's gonna be hard. You're gonna have to sacrifice a lot, but there's so much of enjoying and shit. Like man, yeah, yeah. This thing that is going on right now, like we're like just chilling, talking, having an amazing conversation. Just when we finish, we're gonna have a nice beer and and like chat with the other artists and yeah. talk and about eat some like, food and eat some food. <laughs> so yeah, then it's uh, yeah, man. If you ask your lawyer friends, probably they won't be doing this. <laughs> I think that's a perfect way to end it. So I think that's a really good point. All right, we'll end it there. Um, anything you want to add at the end before we go and get well, some dinner? Not necessarily. Just like. Yeah, keep let's keep enjoying man. <laughs> right on thank you man i really appreciate you taking the time thanks bro <laughs> all right and we're out